This video was sponsored by ourselves. More specifically, our new spin-off project, Flagmaker and Print, is a free online service which allows you to design and print your own custom country flags. I'll have more info after the video. Enjoy the show, guys. The Victorian golden era saw the British ascend to a superpower status, the likes of which the world had never seen before. By the dawn of the 20th century, Great Britain boasted an empire upon which the sun would never set, vast territories and populations under her control, resources beyond human imagination, all guarded by the greatest fleet that had ever sailed the seven seas, the Royal Navy. In those golden days, the empire seemed unassailable. However, her fortunes were about to change, for a spectre was haunting Europe. It was the spectre of syndicalism. The Great War, believed at first to be a quick campaign to subdue the upstart Germans, began a decade-long process of entropy and finally collapse for the British Empire. At the Somme and Passchendaele, from the jungles of East Africa to the North Sea, the Germans chipped away at Britain's imperial advantage. Into the war, Britain poured the wealth of nations, massive sums in gold and silver, material and lives, all accumulated over centuries of imperial rule, all spent in pursuit of victory. But then the war came to an end with a whimper and without a victory. The war's early optimism was replaced with deep hopelessness. As trains full of coffins returned from the front of a lost war, the people of Britain were forced to ask the damning question, what was it all for? As the new decade brought more hard days, not less, and the debt-riddled government floundered, that question echoed from the Houses of Parliament to the city streets. What was it all for? To most, the 1919 peace with honour seemed anything but. While the cities and towns of England had emerged largely unscathed, Britain nursed a set of deep and debilitating wounds. London, once the world's financial capital, found itself profoundly in debt. The nation's youth, once heralds of a new age, lay scattered in shallow graves. With them died the national spirit, once proud, now broken, tainted by pessimism and despair. While the powerful mourned Britain's lost standing, the poor struggled to scrape by. Demobilization left millions jobless, and the nation's debts ushered in a new age of austerity. Yet, even as the almshouses filled, and the breadlines grew, the government found a new object for its spending. Britain's fleet was aging, and with the war's end, German naval programs resumed unabated. To match the Kaiserliche Marine's new Bayern and Mackensen classes, as well as its newer unfinished designs, the Royal Navy ordered a new round of naval expansion. Britain, the government said, could not afford to lose the seas as she had lost continental Europe. In the streets, many struggled to afford the price of bread. The British Empire, strained by humiliation and economic downturn, began showing cracks in her fragile, multi-ethnic web of dependencies. From Dublin to Delhi, the subjects of an empire once thought invincible began dreaming of a future free from foreign domination. The delicate line of dominoes that formed the British Empire had begun to wobble, and Ireland, so close to home, would be the first to fall. Ireland had been a hotbed of discontent long before Britain's fortunes turned in the Great War. Her long existing tensions had already erupted into open rebellion during the Easter Rising of 1916. Although authorities crushed the insurrection, martial law remained in effect across the island, and sporadic fighting continued as the war progressed. By 1918, 
attempts to introduce conscription sparked draft riots, heavily depleting local loyalist paramilitaries, the Ulster Volunteers. Sensing their chance, the increasingly separatist party Sinn Féin called for a boycott of the draft and resistance to the Royal Irish Constabulary, causing its leading members and, most notably, its president, Eamon de Valera, to be arrested for conspiring with Germany. The ongoing riots and strikes in Ireland reached a fever pitch at the Home Rule elections in December. Sinn Féin, London's hated enemies, took the election by a landslide and inaugurated their own legislature, the Dáil Éireann. On December the 8th, the Dáil declared Irish independence with German backing. No longer will the people of Ara sit under the jackboot of the English occupant, the London aristocrat, the oppression of the RIC man. Today, we make right our unlawful occupation by the Anglo-Saxon and return Ireland to her rightful owners, her people, her government. This legislature, the rightful government of the Isle of Ireland, hereby declares independence from Great Britain. I call upon every man of Ireland to take up arms against the oppressors. We shall have our freedom, or we shall have death. Erin Gobra! When the news reaches Lloyd George in London, the Prime Minister is furious. In a special session of Parliament, the British government moves to eliminate the Irish rebels via underhand and sinister tactics. British troops, fresh from the European front, depart for Dublin, and soon German arms begin to flow into Irish hands. As the war drew to a close in Europe, it would continue with cloak and dagger along many conflicts around the world. Despite harsh words and the deployment of troops, Lloyd George's faltering government is determined to fight the Irish war quietly. British soldiers are only to play a supporting role, alongside the Royal Irish Constabulary and their associated paramilitary units, like the Black and Tans, demobilised soldiers from the Western Front. Nonetheless, following its disgrace at the Treaty of Versailles, George's Liberal government collapses in the December elections and is replaced by a Conservative alliance led by Bona Law. As Law's new Conservative government takes power, he vows to crush the Irish Revolution decisively. The limitations placed on British troops are removed and direct action is encouraged. The violence escalates rapidly and soon the River Shannon runs red. Lurid tales of atrocities reach London, shocking the populace deeply. Law's approach is fueled in part by fear and desperation. Across the Channel, France has continued its descent into civil war, and by early April 1920, the situation has clearly spun beyond the government's control. Radical forces in Britain are elated, and talks in the streets speak of revolution, a government for and by the worker. The government uses wartime legislation to clamp down on leftist agitators, but complete suppression is impossible. Soon, a number of fringe parties merge to form the Syndicalist Party of Great Britain. Over the next several years, the party of the gear and torch will rapidly expand, quickly absorbing much of the radical leftist political scene. By early 1921, Law's aggressive policies in Ireland are widely regarded as having been a failure. With the war ongoing, and with a growing list of atrocities accredited to British troops, his government finally sees the writing on the wall. In July, they reluctantly sign a truce, followed in November by a peace treaty, and on December 10, 1921, Ireland is declared independent. As crowds gather in Dublin to celebrate, the occasion is marked in Berlin with handshakes, champagne, and words of congratulation. Even with the war's end, a loss for Britain is a victory for Germany, and it seems certain that the faltering empire is now living on borrowed time. In the end, it was not our victory in the Ved Creek that defeated the British Empire. That defeated Britain was Britain itself. Overextended, exhausted, with the countless millions who chafed under her rule waiting for the first signs of collapse. It then pains me greatly to see our own Reichstag make the very same mistake, not a decade later. How many British colonies can we absorb before the Reich is stretched to her limit? What use is a world empire if a tiny spark can burn it all down? 
in a heartbeat. By 1923, the British Labour Party has grown rapidly, spurred on by the promise of a fairer future without austerity and poverty. With the more radical syndicalist front suppressed by the wider government, leadership is handed to a Labour government in hopes of appeasing the agitated populace, groaning under economic hardship. Despite their electoral victory, Ramsay MacDonald's Labour governs as a minority, dependent on tacit Liberal support. A commitment to peace, an end to austerity, and much-needed housing reform are all popular measures, but as Britain wallows amid economic crises, these promises are left mostly unfulfilled. Repeatedly confounded by its nominal coalition partners and unable to pass effective policy, the government collapses amid the fallout of a minor legal scandal, having lasted less than a year. Protests erupt in the streets, outraged at the swift collapse of the only leftist government in memory as more and more Labour notables begin openly sympathising with the wider leftist front. The nation was in decay. You could hear it, feel it in the streets. It began with the miners, you see. Illegal papers began printing slogans like War of the Lords and Lions Led by Donkeys. When the war ended inconclusively, we had lost so much and gained nothing. In the place of our foreign enemy came a domestic one. Revolution. Government for and by the workers. They called it syndicalism. Following the collapse of the Labour government, the Tories, Liberals, and a breakaway Labour faction under Macdonald form a national government vowing to clean up the budget and exercise constraint. Among their first acts is an end to the naval expansion programme launched nearly four years earlier. Once seen as a vital necessity, the rising issue of war debt repayments and the expensive shipbuilding programme threatened to collapse the budget. Simply put, the government could no longer afford a large navy. The ailing empire faces dramatic deficits, and printing money risks inflating the pound, then still the world's currency, into oblivion. With the stroke of a pen, the dockyards in England fall silent, sending tens of thousands into unemployment. Sensing the instability, foreign governments begin dropping the pound one by one. The British government is forced to take draconian financial measures to keep its currency afloat. Britain's once great fleet rots in underfunded naval bases and tensions with radical factions in the military begin to rise. Popular outrage swells and mass protests fill the streets. It would only take a single spark to light this powder keg. On May the 13th, upon hearing the news of the massive fleet decommissioning and pay cuts, the iconic HMS Hood lands in Plymouth and starts a full-scale mutiny. Although the mutineers are soon arrested, a large crowd at the docks intimidates the police into releasing their captives and calling for backup. The subsequent violent crackdown leads to an open riot across the city. The strikers soon find support from the Transport and General Workers' Union, which calls for solidarity strikes. The national government responds by promptly banning the union. Outraged, Labour and the trade union movement announce a nationwide general strike, and prosecutors face off with the police across Britain. The government, fearing a French-style revolution, moves quickly. The military is sent in to support the police. The situation in Plymouth is tense, but it would be a small, sleepy port in Wales that would dramatically accelerate events. The end of the British Empire would begin, of all places, at Port Talbot in Wales. In September that year, a soldier at Port Talbot panics and opens fire on striking workers. In response, the strikers storm the local barracks and assault the garrison. The national government, confused and panicked by this unruly mob, declares a state of emergency and begins banning multiple leftist organisations. Labour MPs that speak in favour of the strikers are arrested in the Commons and charged with sedition, a major breach of parliamentary privilege. With blood flowing and violence exploding across the nation, the government mobilises the Territorial Army. The loyalty of these local forces is found wanting, however, 
as large parts of the Cardiff regiments go into mutiny. The workers and soldiers declare the Cardiff Commune, and much of South Wales falls to the rebels. Around the same time, syndicalist rebels and soldiers clash at the Battle of the Railways in Livingston between Edinburgh and Glasgow. The disorganised and undersupplied army is defeated by the rebel surge, and much of Scotland falls to a syndicalist uprising. Scottish independence groups mix with the left-wing front and declare a Scottish Republic. Across England, police officers and soldiers desert their posts. Liverpool declares itself a free city and falls to the rebels by December. She is joined by Manchester on Christmas Day. The home isles are tearing at the seams, with tense firefights erupting over key points. The British Civil War has begun. In 1925, with Royalist artillery thundering in the distance, the leading cast of the trade unions and leftist parties gather in Liverpool to formalise their revolution and declare the Union of Britain. The Union Jack, the flag that has flown over the British Isles and much of the world for the better part of five centuries, is taken down. In her place, the soldiers raise an unfamiliar red, white, green Republican flag. Based on the little-known British Republican flag, the new scarlet hoist is proudly emblazoned with the golden symbol of the syndicalist gear and torch. The Internationale proudly proclaims that revolution in Europe is only the beginning. From Dublin to Cape Town, from Los Angeles to Tokyo, one day the world revolution would come to every nation. Three scarlet banners now fly over Western Europe, and more would soon follow. Gathered syndicalist militias line up outside and salute the rising crimson banner as an orchestra plays the Internationale. With thunderous applause, the Union of Britain is declared as the successor government of the United Kingdom. No longer will the workers of Britain suffer under the yoke of the ruling class. No longer will we yield the power and fruits of our labor to noble houses built upon theft and slavery. No longer will we die in foreign wars to line bosses' pockets. Now is the time of the common man, the iron worker and the pit man, the fighter and the shipbreaker. Now we build the workers' state, a union of Britain. Let our chains be broken forever. After the ceremony, George Lansbury is tapped as president and A.J. Cook is elected chairman. Leading Scottish officials join the Union of Britain, leading to a unified syndicalist front and the dissolution of the Scottish Provisional Republic. The fall of Wales sends the royalist government into turmoil. Martial law is declared for the entirety of Great Britain and the royal family is evacuated to Canada under the guise of a state visit. The Union manages to push down towards the River Trent as the Territorial Army begins to defect near the Greater London area. The opening phases of the war saw successes for the Royalist forces, however. Especially the difference in artillery and naval support means that the Royalists, backed by the ever-loyal Royal Navy, manage to hold on to the most important coastal cities and push the syndicalists inward in many confrontations. The war escalates further by foreign volunteers streaming into the United Kingdom. Foreign troops from both sides of the ideological struggle clash on the British Isles, now a war zone. The technological advantage of pro-government troops soon proves to be ineffective against the ideological fervour of the syndicalist rebels, who begin to outnumber royalist forces after mere months. Despite their best efforts, no artillery can match the teeming masses of disgruntled workers, revolutionary partisans and inner-city folk that join the revolution en masse. By spring, the royalists' fortunes would turn as royalist forces push out from the cities, they soon find the disloyal worker population of the areas they control turn against them. Wherever they attempt to sally from their fortified city positions, royalist forces are met with insurgency and sabotage. Rail workers, many loyal to the syndicalist cause, ensure that the control of stockade and supply trains remain in red hands. 
Furthermore, systematic subversion of the rail networks around royalist bastions ensures they remain trapped in their own fortifications. The king's forces are encircled and supplied only by the naval support from the Royal Navy. Facing enemies within and without, royalist strongholds in the West Midlands begin falling one by one. By midsummer, the first units of loyalists and the new Republican army clash at Nottingham, leading to a shocking victory for Red forces. With London falling into rebel hands soon after, Royalist forces realise the war has finally turned against them. In Northern Ireland, the Ulster elite enter secret negotiations with their Irish counterparts, but the talks drag on. Later, threats of separate British and Irish invasions push them to pick the lesser evil, hastily but reluctantly joining the Republic. London has fallen and the Union is broken. The Navy attempts to mass evacuate nobles and loyalists all over England. These mass evacuations cause a general panic and chaos at the ports as the Empire begins to unravel. The evacuation was a dismal affair. Proper ladies and gentlemen crowded into cramped military ships like cattle clinging to their meagre belongings and what they had managed to save from their opulent mansions before fleeing the country like rats. Many found their staff suddenly turned against them, and many more were turned over to the syndicalist rabble before they had a chance to escape. On the ships, we fought over scraps and food. I saw two men in full evening wear enter a fistfight over a single can of tuna. So went our procession of hunger and thirst. As our home, Great Albion, disappeared in the horizon, smoke billowing over her once great cities. Never had I known such defeat and humiliation. Our way of life, the British Empire, it all collapsed in mere months. Europe burns under a scarlet banner, and I'm afraid soon the world will follow her example. By autumn, Canadian troops begin to mobilise, hoping to stall syndicalist momentum. Whatever remains of the retreating loyalists are now only focused on keeping the ports open as long as possible. They are pursued relentlessly by syndicalist forces attempting to close the southern ports before the onset of winter. The Republican army would fail their blitz offensive, but only barely. Plymouth, Brighton, and Southampton form a final defensive line against the syndicalist tide. Minefields and delaying actions keep the rebels at bay as the last notables are evacuated from the war zone. Fearing incoming Canadian reinforcements, the Union of Britain negotiates an intervention with the Commune of France. They help the Republican Army stage a daring proto-commando raid on Southampton. Tense nightly firefights erupt among the ports, and the citizens of these southern cities awake to commune flags flying over their homes. Fearing imminent French invasion, the government abandons its positions and officially declares its intent to pull out of Britain. Soon, syndicalist forces have raised scarlet banners over all the cities of England proclaiming their victory. The revolution has been won. Great Britain, the eternal empire, had collapsed. Across the Channel, the German Empire saw her final victory at last, but perhaps not the one she went looking for a decade earlier. Her hated enemies were in ruins, yes, but replacing the flawed democracies of France and Britain were new, revanchist, syndicalist states, with world revolution as their overriding goal. This threat and all it implies would define the rest of the 1920s and beyond. In the Union of Britain, however, those who favour what remained of the former government have only seen the beginning of what their new government portends. In 1926, with the Home Isles secured, former Labour MP and now Deputy Chairman John Wheatley establishes a secret police force called Special Operations Executive the SOE takes office in Vauxhall and reports only to the Deputy Chairman of the Union. An internal security organisation dedicated wholly to ideological purification 
The SOE's actual size and operations become wreathed in secrecy and fear. Not long after their formation, remaining nobles in the home islands, deemed reactionary threats by the new syndicalist government, begin disappearing one by one. Black trains cross the British heartland with no travel manifest or destination. The British Red Terror has begun. The terror becomes a grim reminder of the cost of civil war and marks the end of the social democratic dream of the labor wing of the Union's leadership. Appalled by the news of the SOE's formation, Union President Lansbury resigns from his post. From the memoirs of G. Lansbury, in 1925, a darkness began to spread over our Union. Our dream of a social revolution for and by the worker was corrupted by radicalists into a rehearsal of the Jacobean nightmare of the 1700s. It pains my heart to see the party fall to such depths of ideological depravity, bringing fire and death to its own people. I see within London today figments of the failed Bolshevik revolution a few years ago and warn our members that syndicalists should not repeat the mistakes of the communists. You cannot shake the devil's hand and say you were only joking. What remained of the British government proper congregated in Canada, vowing to one day reclaim the home isles from syndicalist mob rule. However, Britain's expansive colonial empire could not endure without a government in London. Even before the evacuations began, it had already begun to splinter, as scattered and often confusing reports filtered out to the wider empire. With the head cut from the snake, the Dominions turned inward and committed to their own defence. The colonies, abandoned and freed from the shadow of the Royal Navy, entered a period of upheaval. India, once the Empire's crown jewel, finally collapsed into civil war between British-aligned forces and independence-minded revolutionaries. British settlers, threatened by native majorities and fear of syndicalist agitation, abandoned by their government and the Dominions alike, soon found themselves looking to Berlin to replace the Royal Navy's stabilizing influence. In a cruel twist of irony, Germany had become the sole defender of the imperial order she once sought to usurp. Her status as a superpower remained unchallenged, but now the rising syndicalist tide threatened to undermine her very foundation, constitutional monarchy and the underpinnings of empire. Slowly, the legacy of the Weltkrieg became clear for all to see. Germany emerged out of the Weltkrieg on the path to great power status. However, she would be challenged on every continent by syndicalist nations and uprisings. Leftist insurgencies sprung up all over the globe, destabilizing Germany's tenuous new grasp on power and ushering in a new age of revolution. Across the world, battle lines were beginning to form. The answer could only ever be a new Great War, a new Weltkrieg. In the new age beyond the horizon, the sun would rise over a new empire upon which it would never set, or it would rise over a world beneath the Scarlet Banner. To be continued. Hey everyone, Vincent here, founder of Guys Get Cinema and the director of this episode. I wanted to pop in to present our newest project, Flag Maker and Print. A lot of our fans love the alt history flags we've been making for our own webshop and have been asking me for a way to upload their own designs. As big Vexillology fans, this sounded like a great idea to us. So we launched Flagmaker and Print. Flagmaker and Print is our sister webshop with an integrated flag editing tool so you can upload your own designs and print them. Flagmaker and Print is made by the same team behind Kaisercat Cinema and it also helps fund our videos. If you're looking for additional ways to support our work or you just want to design some of your own flags, go check out our new site, flagmakerprint.com. What if Germany had won World War I? 
Thank you for watching the Kaiserreich documentary, a deep dive into the rich and detailed universe and history behind the world of Kaiserreich, an entire universe based on a single premise. What if Germany had won World War I? We are Kaisercat Cinema, a worldwide collective of artists, writers, actors and musicians dedicated exclusively to making quality art, video and music content set within the alt history world of Kaiserreich. We are planning about 8 episodes of documentary content with a runtime of about 30 minutes each, totaling a 4 hour documentary series. I am Vincent Tenil, Kaiserreich artist and founder of Kaiserreich Cinema, and I appear at the end of every video to thank you for your continued support. Creating these complex videos requires large amounts of time and effort by our worldwide team of indie artists. We are therefore grateful for all your continued support to Kaiserkat Cinema and her crew. Please consider supporting us by visiting our Alt History webshop and buying some of our original Alt History art prints. You can also check out our new spin-off project, Flagmaker and Print, which allows you to design and print your own custom Alt History flags and print them on flags, stickers, shirts, and more. The Union of Britain poster painted to celebrate the release of this video by me and Seymour is also available on the webshop. Kaiserkat Cinema would not be possible without the unrelenting support of our 130 plus patron backers and crew. Patrons can make cameo appearances in our art and animations as you can see in the frame below me. The Syndicate recognizes Supreme Backer John Thomas Justice, who shall stand firm in the face of syndicalist subversion. We also recognize top backers Isael, Breaker of Chains, Mr. Knowledge, who soars high above us in his new ME262, Devo, Wolfrunner, who walks with the Kingfish, Kicker of the International Nationalists, Alex Depage, Raven Legion Pilot Extraordinaire, Kingfish58, who is chanting with the Funker Radio Legion, De Preussen of the Gallant Cavalry, Jill Bates, Kingfish58, bringing the Kaiser's will to America, Loki95, who is passing the ammunition, and we can of course not forget Lincoln Neal, Lydia, Luna, Welfare Checks, and many others. We also recognize our cameo cats. Their numbers are many, and their spirit is in every video. Thanks to Alex Burchartz, Alexander, Joshua Butler, Lincoln Neal, Sheridan's Reaver, Ben Davenport, Castro, Stefan Gunnarsson, Luna Walter, Martin Svensson, Russell Apfel, Jules Bellia, Peter Bacon, and many more. Webshop customers, Patreon backers, and Discord members. They are the United Front. All support the cinema in their own way. Will you back us in our continued efforts to bring this universe we all love to the world? Will you back the attack? Will you join the United Front? Thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing you for the next one, cats.